Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time together. We pray that all that is said and done here would please you. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. I want to talk this morning about the two big things. And by this, I mean, there are, there are two things that you absolutely have to get clarity on in life if your life is going to make sense. And so start with me. I'd like to get two passages. Get 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and then also get Romans 16, 25. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and then Romans 16, verse 25. All right, I'm going to start in 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will, this is God's will, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that God's will consists of two components. The first is that all men be saved, and then the second is that they come unto the knowledge of the truth. There's two aspects of God's will in that passage. Now compare that with Romans 16, verse 25. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you. To establish something is to stabilize it, to make it stable, to put it on secure footing. Now to him that is of power to establish you, now notice this, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. 1 Timothy 2 said that God's will was two things. The first was all men be saved, and the second was to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Romans 16.25 says that God has the ability to establish people, but they're established by two things, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So let's connect these things. In 1 Timothy 2, God's will is that all men be saved. How are all men saved today? my gospel. And, and the my gospel there is Paul's gospel. Can you get saved today during the dispensation of grace by a gospel from a different dispensation? No. And the answer is you can't. One of the things that, that people do all the time, and you, you've no doubt seen this, is that people find verses or they find promises or they find things they like in other portions of the Bible, and then they claim that for themselves today. And, and, and that just doesn't work. God's not going to change what He's doing because people usurp things that don't belong to them. So God's desire that all men be saved lines up with Paul's gospel. The second part of 1 Timothy 2 was to come unto the knowledge of the truth, and what that lines up with is the preaching of Jesus Christ but the preaching of Jesus Christ in a specific way. What did Romans 16, 25 say? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. In the Scriptures, Peter and the Twelve and Paul both preached Christ. There were some things about Christ that they preached that were the same. They both preached that Christ was the Son of God. They both preached that He rose from the dead. But did they preach the exact same message entirely? And they did not. So what we want to do today is we want to understand this. We want to get crystal clear on what Paul's gospel is, and then we want to get clear on what it means to come unto the knowledge of the truth, what, what it refers to when it refers to the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So get 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll look at verses 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. Now, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So he's declaring, he's specifying exactly what the gospel is. In verse 3, he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, 
and that he was buried, and they rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul's gospel in its simplest form, in its summarized form, is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. The reason why it's important to get clear on the gospel, the good news, is that if you truly understand what the gospel is, you will have no misconceptions that it's part of your works or your righteousness. When Paul refers to the gospel in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried. Christ rose again. There is nothing we can do to add to that in our own righteousness or works or effort. There's just nothing we can do. Now, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace, grace is unmerited favor. It's unearned blessing. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Faith is belief. Now, the thing I'll just emphasize on, on faith is this. You can stand like this, not move a muscle and have faith. Now, if you were trying to work and get something done, could you get much done if you're just standing still, not moving? And the answer is you couldn't. But you can have faith without moving a muscle. You can have faith without making any effort. What, when you have faith, what happens is it's an internal decision to trust something. I'm standing on this platform because I believe that it will hold my weight. If I didn't believe it would hold my weight, I wouldn't stand upon it, obviously. Well, faith is, is trusting something. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's not your list of accomplishments, it's not your resume, it is the gift of God, it's a gift, something you earn. Then Ephesians 2.9 is explicitly clear, not of works. So is salvation in any way dependent upon man's works? None, not at all. And Ephesians 2.9 ends with this, lest any man should boast. Last week, we dealt with a Q&A regarding how do I witness to this specific group? In other words, here's a specific denomination, whatever it is, how do I witness to them? And my encouragement to you is, is not to find a different witnessing method for every different belief system in the world, because you could spend all your time designing those. But the simple fact of the matter is this. People are saved by the gospel of grace. Every false gospel is similar in that it adds works. So some gospels will say you have to live by the golden rule. Some will say you have to be water baptized. Some will say that you have to tithe. In other words, what they do is they add a work to the simplicity of grace. What Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says is that when we're saved by grace through faith, what it emphasizes in verse 9 is, lest any man should boast. What is man's natural instinctive tendency? It's to boast. You're familiar with this, but if you think of the, 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 the basic question, if, if God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? Which is a great question to ask people. The typical response you get is people's list of reasons of things they've accomplished, right? I'm basically a good person. I've never hurt anyone. My good outweighs my bad. I gave to charity. And, 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 and there's a list. Of course, we know that none of those things can save us because Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us can be saved by works, but people's answer to the question, what must I do to be saved, or what do I need to do to make it into heaven, almost always involves their works. What the Scriptures cl clearly teach is that you're saved by grace through faith. You're saved when you believe something about what Jesus Christ did for you. In Acts 16, 30, and 31, when Paul is in the jail in Philippi, he's, with, he's there with Silas, the Philippian jailer runs in, and he says to them specifically, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
which is the single question that everyone has to answer in this life. There's no question that compares to that. And what Paul says is he doesn't give him a list of works to perform. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In other words, what he's saying to him is what you need to do is you need to trust what Jesus Christ did for you when he shed his blood on the cross. The moment that you trust that, God saves you forever. Get with me Romans 11, verse 6. Now, I'm going to suggest something to you, and you can decide whether or not this is true. There are a lot of unsaved people in churches, because going to church doesn't get you saved. The only thing that saves you is when you believe the gospel. I was in a church. I was confirmed in the church. I went through confirmation class, not really didn't do a great job of that. I missed most of the classes. I did just enough, the bare minimum, and they confirmed me as a member of the church. And you know what I was? I was lost. I was lost because I had not actually trusted what Christ did for me when he died for my sins. I had this confused idea that my good outweighed my bad. Now look at me at Romans 11, verse 6. And by the way, I was lost at that point. I knew Jesus Christ was a historical figure. I knew that. And I knew he died on the cross, and I knew he rose from the dead. I knew every fact, you know, those facts about the gospel, right? I knew Christ was the Son of God. I knew he was a real person. I knew he died on the cross. I knew he rose from the dead. I knew all of that. But I didn't trust it. Because in my inner man, I was self-righteous. I thought my good outweighs my bad. I've, I've done enough. Look with me at Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. I am persuaded of the following. You can decide for yourself whether this is true or not. But there's an, an enormous segment of Christendom that is churched, that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that, that know that he died on the cross for their sins. They know that he resurrected. They know that salvation is by grace what's coming. But you got to live it. But if you do that, then you lose it. Have you ever had conversations like that? Where, in other words, people understand salvation is by grace, but if you suggest that it's 100% grace and works have nothing to do with it, they'll balk at that. They'll put up their defenses. Well, you're saying you could live like the devil and still be saved. Absolutely. And if you don't believe that, then you must believe that your works matter. There's the only two options, either your works matter or they don't. And if you think they matter, then you believe in work salvation. Now, let's be clear. Should a saved person perform works of righteousness? Yes. By the way, a lost person should perform works of righteousness, right? Because when you do evil things, there's consequences to that. Whether you're saved or lost, any time you sin, you run the risk of all the following. First is, you may have trouble with human authorities. They may lock you up. That's problem number one. Problem number two, when you sin, what does it do to yourself? Are you better for it or worse? You're always, always worse. None of us today, does, does anyone here, when you get a, get a car, do you, do, does anyone actually read the owner's manual? No one does. But, but let me say this. If you operate the car inconsistent with the owner's manual, 
What's going to happen? What if I decide gas is too expensive? I'm going to try lemonade. I fill the tank with lemonade. What's going to happen? It'll destroy it, right? Because I am operating this vehicle that was designed to function in a certain way, and I'm operating it inconsistent with how it's designed. That can only be bad, right? What mankind does when we sin is we operate in a way inconsistent with the owner's manual, right? God designed the universe. He explained to us in the scriptures how the universe works. When I say, appreciate the input, I know better, is that going to end well or poorly? It's going to end poorly. It can't help but end poorly. God designed us. He knows us. He loves us. He's given us the instructions for how to live. But here's the point I want to make. When Ephesians 2.9 ends with, lest any man should boast, man's self-righteousness is so ingrained, it's so ingrained that man will say in the same sentence, God saves by grace, but you got to live it. The second part contradicts the first part. God saves by grace, but you lose it if you do this. Then it's not grace. Right. Romans 11.6 says, And if by grace, then is it only a little bit of works? That's not what it says. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. In other words, what Romans 11.6 is saying, and I, I know I beat this like a dead horse, but I'm convinced that it's what separates people from, from heaven and the lake of fire. The way that salvation works, it's 100% based on grace. It's not grace and your works adding to it. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Anytime, if you're clinging to your works in any form, then what you are saying is that Christ's death on the cross was not entirely sufficient for your salvation. It's his death on the cross plus something you do. It does not work that way. And, and by the way, that is an insult to what Christ did. To suggest that the Son of God, who was righteous and holy and perfect, and he took upon your sins, and he paid the penalty for them, and to think that you have to add some works to that is just madness, and it's insulting, and God will not save people in that heart attitude. 1 Corinthians 1 specifically says that no flesh should glory in his presence. God won't save us when we want to glory in our flesh. So let me say this, and then we'll move on to the next point. Please, get clarity on the gospel, meaning it is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And what happens is when you come to the point where you realize my righteousness, my works will never be enough to meet God's standard of perfect righteousness. And so therefore, I'm going to trust what Christ did for me on the cross. I'm going to trust that and that alone. The moment I believe that in the inner man, God saves me forever. You have to get that right. You have to get that right. Here's what modern life is. Modern life is busier than life has ever been before, right? And what happens as you go through life is you have a million responsibilities and distractions and things competing for your time. And so you're like the hamster on the wheel. You know the hamster where he runs and runs and runs and runs and runs, and he makes no progress because it's this circular wheel, right? And that's a lot of what modern life is. It's activity, activity, 
activity, and it, it, it never ends. There's always more that you could do. What I'm emphasizing here is, in the midst of all those things competing for your time, competing for your attention, you've got to get the issue of your salvation right. Because you get that wrong and there's nothing that can fix it. Okay? So that's the first big thing. Let's talk about the second big thing. What Romans 15, uh, 16, 25 mentioned, it mentioned the preaching of Jesus Christ, and then it said, according to the revelation of the mystery. Meaning that if you're going to be established today, if your spiritual life is going to be made stable, you have to understand the specific preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Get with me Galatians 2, verse 7. Have you noticed that there are things that circulate either in the media or common thought that are totally false? Have you, can someone maybe think of one or two things that way? And you've, you've no doubt, if you've lived life for any length of time, you realize that the world system is full of lies, right? It's full of things that are just myths that are just completely false. Okay. There are Christian myths. There are Christian superstitions. There are Christian false beliefs that are widely held. One of those is that Peter and Paul preach the exact same message. So what people think is, if you think, like, think of Acts 1 with me. Judas betrays the Lord. Judas commits suicide. How many apostles were there before Judas committed suicide? Twelve. How many tribes of Israel were there? Twelve. So when Judas commits suicide, you got a math problem, right? Because you have 11 apostles and 12 tribes. So in early Acts, what does the kingdom church do? They pray, they cast lots, they identify Matthias, they make him one of the 12. But then what happens as you read through the book of Acts, you realize, wait a minute, this, this Paul seems like kind of a big deal. I mean, he wrote 13 epistles. He wrote more books than anyone else in the Bible, but he's not one of the 12, right? Because he's not, because it, it was resolved in Acts chapter 1 that he was not one of the 12. So what some will say is, well, okay, so the, the kingdom church was wrong. They were gambling. And they cast lots, and they picked Matthias, and they made a big mistake. And so what people then think is, well, here's what happened. Well, Paul couldn't have been the 12th apostle because at the time they were picking apostles, Paul wasn't even a believer, right? In Acts 7, what's Paul doing? He's persecuting the church. Well, you, let me ask you this. This is the easiest question today. Would Paul have been a good choice as an apostle in Acts chapter 7? He's kind of contrary to what you're trying to accomplish, so probably not a good choice to pick him. So what people think is, well, Paul, he was rebellious in early Acts. He was on the wrong side. But then when he got saved in Acts 9, then Paul did the same thing as the 12. He just was stubborn. But once he got saved, then he did the exact same thing. Galatians 2 verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Circumcision and uncircumcision are not the same thing, right? If you take any word and you put UN before it, what do you end up doing? You deny it, right? So if you take usual, and you put un before it, it's the denial of usual, because something that is unusual is not usual. Something that is unnatural is not natural. You get the point. Is uncircumcision and circumcision the same thing? Obviously not. So I realize it is widely said that Peter and Paul preach the same gospel. You can't read Galatians 2.7 and believe that.
Let me see if this is your experience. Have you ever had someone tell you, hey, I really like my church, and the reason why is we do whatever we want. We don't pay any attention to the Bible. No. What does everyone say? Everyone says about their church, we go by what the Bible says. You haven't heard anyone say, you know what's great about our church? We just do whatever we want. No one says that. They all claim, they claim to go by the Bible, but it cannot be that all do because they teach different things. So everyone claims to go by the Bible, but obviously that, that can't be the case. Well, in Galatians 2, 7, when people claim that Peter and Paul preach the same gospel, you bump into this obvious fact that they have different gospels, right? I mean, uncircumcision and circumcision are not the same. Give me Colossians 1, verse 25. Have you ever worked on assembling something and got close to the end and realized that you missed a step or you did the step wrong and then you got to take it all apart? I normally discover these things after I've hit things with hammers or I've tightened them to the point where undoing this is now a problem, right? I've shared this before, but I'm popular at Home Depot. And that's because I don't just visit there once. It takes multiple trips to get anything done. Measure once, cut twice. Measure twice, cut once. What's the moral of all this? The moral of all this is before you start using power tools, measure double check, be certain of what you're doing, right? That, that, that is just good advice for life. What most people do in their Christian life is they operate and they serve without ever have gotten clarity on what they should do. So then you get to the end of it, and you realize, wait a minute, and I, I know examples of this. I know examples of folks that preached in a certain denomination for 40 years. Afterwards, they come to an understanding of the mystery, and their observation is, I wasted my entire ministerial life because I spent the entire time preaching something that God is not doing. What, what a danger that is, Right? Look with me at Colossians 1, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, I know people say dispensationalism was invented in the 1800s. That's crazy. Dispensationalism is in the Word of God. Now, if you notice what Colossians 1.25 says, the dispensation was given to whom? Yeah, to me, to Paul, for you. God gave the information to Paul so that he could dispense it, so that he could reveal it to others. What it's exactly like, God did the exact same thing with Moses. God called Moses up on Mount Sinai, and what did God do? God gave him revelation, and then he said, Moses, I want you to keep that to yourself, put it in a safe deposit box, and don't tell anyone because it's just for you. No. What did he do? I want you to go down. I want you to reveal it to Israel. So God gave the information to Moses for distribution, for sharing with, with Israel. That is, in fact, the same thing that God did with Paul based upon Colossians 1.25. Now, this is just a fascinating little tidbit. It's worth some, some study on this when you get a chance. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to receive that revelation. 
where does Paul go to receive the revelation that God gives to him? Well, he goes into Arabia, according to Galatians 4, and in that same book, it mentions that Sinai is in Arabia. So you can decide for yourself. What I strongly suspect, you know where I think Paul went when he went into Arabia? I think he went to Mount Sinai, just like Moses did, to receive the revelation that he was then to distribute to humanity. I'll give you just some other hints. You can study this for yourself. Moses was a murderer before God began to use him, right? What was Paul before that? Yeah. And there's multiple parallels between them. And what I would suggest to you is just as Moses is the great revealer, he was the chosen vessel to reveal the Old Testament to humanity, what is Paul? Paul is the chosen vessel to reveal the dispensation of grace for the time period in which we live. Get Ephesians 3, verse 1. I'm going to go through Ephesians 3 quickly. Probably won't, but I'm going to represent that I will. And the thing to notice as we go through Ephesians 3 is how many different times and how many different ways Ephesians 3 makes the point that Paul has new information. The reason why this is so critical is the following. If you want to say Peter and Paul are teaching the same gospel, well, then Paul's gospel can't be new, right? I mean, isn't that obvious? If, if Paul is teaching the exact same thing as Peter, then it can't be new because Peter's already been preaching it. But if it, in fact, is new, then it has to be different. So ponder that, but that fundamental axiom, that fundamental principle tells you that Peter and Paul must have different messages. Ephesians 3.1, For this cause I, Paul, prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, just let me ask you about that verse. Could Peter have written something saying, for you Gentiles? When God specifically commanded him not to go to Gentiles? Matthew 10, verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. That's exactly like what we looked at in Colossians 1.25. It was given to Paul to you word for him to distribute. Verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. How did Paul get this information? He received it by revelation. Now just think through this with me. Prior to Acts 9, did Paul have a complete understanding of the kingdom gospel. He did. If you think about what Paul does when he's persecuting the church, is he persecuting the church because he doesn't like Jewish people? That's not the reason, because he's Jewish. The reason Paul is persecuting the church is he believes their doctrine is heresy. That's his motivation. It's not, a, it's not a racial or ethnic or some kind of motivation. He's doing that because he believes their doctrine is heresy. Well, if he's persecuting them because he thinks their doctrine is wrong, doesn't he have to know their doctrine? How would he otherwise know that it's wrong? He fully knows their doctrine. So in Ephesians 3.3, 3, when Paul says how that by revelation... It was made known unto me the mystery. It can't be Peter's content. Paul would not have needed revelation. He already knew it. Keep looking here. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Was Paul given specific knowledge in the mystery of Christ? Yes, he was. Now notice verse 5 which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. 
Now, I'm guessing your experience is similar to mine. As you matriculate through Christianity, do you come to realize that you've been told a bunch of stuff that is not true? One of the things I was told early on is today we are saved looking backward to the cross, just as in time past everyone was saved looking forward to the cross. And so the gospel is the same throughout time, never changed. That's crazy. I realize it, it's a nice, warm sounding cliche, but what does verse 5 say? Which in other ages was not made known? Well, if it wasn't made known, could it have been believed? It couldn't have been. So when people say, well, everyone throughout time is always saved by believing the same thing, that's crazy. Let's take a simple example. What did Noah need to believe to be saved? Did he believe that Jesus Christ died for his sins, was buried, and rose again the third day? That's not what he believed. God revealed that he was going to flood the earth. God gave him instructions on how to build an ark, and Noah, in faith, built an ark. That's what he did. He didn't get water baptized. His whole purpose was to avoid being water baptized right? He was, as some would say, a dry cleaner. Look with me at verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now people say, aha, gotcha. See, that says apostles and prophets, plural, and so that refers to the twelve. That doesn't refer to the twelve. You're in Ephesians 3, if you read Ephesians 4, when God gave some apostles and prophets, those are for the body of Christ. There is more than one apostle in the body of Christ. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, but doesn't Acts 14 refer to Barnabas as an apostle as well? Yeah, that's what's going on there. Verse 6, now again, we're pondering whether Peter and Paul preach the same thing. But the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So we're going to come back to this, but get Acts 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts 10, verse 28. This is Peter and he's dealing with Cornelius here. Acts 10, 28, and he said unto them, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation, but God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Let's pause here and make sure we understand what's going on here. In Acts 10, Peter is hungry, and he has a vision. And he sees this sheet let down, and it has in it all manner of unclean animals. And a voice says to him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, Peter, based upon his understanding of Leviticus, how should he react to that? He sees a vision. It has all kinds of unclean animals. It says, Kill and eat. What should Peter do? Well, his answer is, no, I'm not going to eat unclean animals. I mean, Leviticus is absolutely clear not to eat unclean animals. I'm not doing that. The voice tells him that three times. Because, and, and I, I'm, Peter often is criticized. I'm sympathetic to him. Would it be hard if you had lived under the Old Testament law, you're an observant Jew, and someone says, go eat an unclean animal? Would you hesitate to do that? You would. That's why he had to have a vision telling him to do that. Now, if you notice what Acts 28 says, it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come to one, unto one of another nation. Peter understands the Old Testament law and understands it correctly that Jews are not to go unto Gentiles. That's completely consistent with what the Lord said during his earthly ministry in Matthew 10, when he said, go not 
into the way of the Gentiles. Now compare that with Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Is there anywhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or early Acts where that is taught? There's not. It's taught directly contrary to that. The point is, Ephesians 3, this mystery revelation given to Paul, is different from what was previously given to Peter in the 12th. Verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles, which Peter was told not to do, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Get John 5, 39. John chapter 5 and verse 39. Now in John 5, we're looking at the Lord's earthly ministry, and he is dealing with unbelieving Jews. Now notice what he says to them. Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. What he's saying to these unbelieving Jews that don't believe that he's the Christ. What he says to them is, you think you have eternal life in the Old Testament Scriptures. In other words, you think you're observing what the Old Testament tells you to do. But search it and read it, because if you do that, what is the Old Testament going to tell you about Jesus Christ? They are they which testify of me. Meaning, if you read the Old Testament, the Messiah has to come from the tribe of Judah. He has to come from the line of David. He has to be born in Bethlehem. He has to be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. He has to be born of a virgin. In other words, if you read the Old Testament, and it's, it's, like a, it's almost like a detective thing, there's clue flu, 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 flu. And if you read the Old Testament and believe it, when Jesus of Nazareth shows up, what should your conclusion be? This is who the Old Testament scriptures have been talking about the whole time. Amen. Now, I'm going to read it one more time just to see this. Search the scriptures. He's telling them, read the Old Testament, study it. For in them you think you have eternal life. You think you're following the Old Testament, but you're not. How do I know that? And they are they which testify of me. What he's really saying to them is this. You guys claim to be going by the Old Testament. You claim to believe it, but you obviously don't. Because if you read the Old Testament and you believed it, you know who you would think I am? You would realize I'm the fulfillment. I'm exactly who the Old Testament points to. Now compare that idea. Search the Scriptures. Compare that with Ephesians 3, verse 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles notice this, the unsearchable riches of Christ. So we talked about the word or the prefix un before. What does un mean? Not. Paul preached the unsearchable, the not searchable riches of Christ. What does that tell you about whether you can find Paul's content in the Old Testament? It's not there because it's unsearchable, because, verse 5 says, which in other ages was not made known. God made it known unto Paul, verse 3, by revelation. It's revelation of the mystery. What is the scriptural definition of a mystery? In wisdom, yes, thank you. We'll come back to Ephesians 3, 9, get 1 Corinthians. Well, let's do Ephesians 3, 9 first. Ephesians 3, 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, 
Now notice this, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So the fellowship of the mystery, it's been hid since when? The beginning of the world, and where was it hid? It doesn't say it was hid in the Old Testament, it says it was hid in God. Now here's the way things work in this life. If you have a really juicy secret, you want someone to tell it to. You know this is true. When God hides things, does he like get all excited and he just can't help himself and he says, I got to tell someone? No. When the mystery was hid in God, it was hid in God from the beginning of the world all the way up until God determined it was the proper time to reveal it, and that was to the Apostle Paul. Now, the reason why that matters, if it was hid in God until God revealed it, can you credibly say that people knew it in time past? It doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's illogical. It's contrary. Now get 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. I'm sure you have heard this. One of the questions that people always ask is, who else believes like this? And, and what, what, what occurs is you tell them something straight out of the Bible, you read a verse to them, and their answer is, well, who else believes like this? Now, I love this story, so I'm going to tell it. But They held a vote three months before the flood, and they asked all of humanity, is there going to be a flood or not? And Noah lost in a landslide. How many votes did he get? Eight. Millions and millions thought he was wrong. But after the flood, Noah asked for a recount. <laughs> and he won eight to zero. My point is, is truth determined by popular vote? It's not. Truth is what truth is. It doesn't matter whether anyone believes it or not. But I do want to consider the question of why are there so few who believe the mystery? Because it is few who do. Look at me at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of a God in a mystery. Notice this, even the hidden wisdom. What that verse is telling you is that the Bible definition of what a mystery is, is it's hidden wisdom. The mystery, even the hidden wisdom. Now notice this, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You're all familiar with the fact that in Luke 22, immediately before the cross, who is it that enters into Judas? Satan does. Satan himself enters into Judas. And the reason why he does is if you want a job done right, do it yourself. Are humans incompetent bumblers? Yes. So Satan definitely wants the cross to happen. He looks at humanity as basically, you guys are incompetent. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to enter into Judas because I want to make sure this happens. What that tells you, was Satan in favor of the cross? Clearly, or else he wouldn't have done that. Now, when Satan is in favor of the cross in Luke 22, does Satan know that Jesus Christ is going to die for the sins of the world. Thou shalt call, Matthew 1, 21, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Satan at a minimum understands that, that Jesus Christ is going to die for Israel's sins. He's going to redeem them. He knows that. Does Satan understand that Jesus Christ is going to rise from the dead? Yes. Because in John 2, 19, Jesus Christ says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, the people the Lord was speaking to didn't understand it. Did Satan understand it? Satan understood it, which means that Satan was in favor of the cross, even though he knew about the resurrection, and even though he knew that it would redeem Israel. He knew both of those things, and he still was in favor of the cross. But 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 says something fascinating. It says, with regard to this mystery, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There is something about 
Paul's revelation that is so game-changing that if Satan had known this before the cross, he never would have been in favor of the cross. And, and here, here's what it is. Where does the body of Christ spend eternity? Heavens. Now, if you put yourself in Acts 8, and you're Satan, and you survey the universe, Satan has a squabble with God over control of the earth. God wants Israel to ultimately inherit and rule over the earth. Satan doesn't want that. The simplest proof of that, when Israel goes into Egypt, and they spend a long time there, Gabe can tell you exactly how long. What does Satan do in response? Well, he puts giants in the promised land, and he puts giants in the promised land because God had previously revealed that he was going to bring Israel into the promised land. So Satan looks at this and says, well, okay, God has said he's going to bring Israel into the promised land. They're not there right now, so why don't I move on in and fortify myself? Doesn't, in fact, Satan dig in? Scripture says that there were fortified cities in the promised land when Israel is trying to go in, meaning Satan moved his folks in, the giants, they established cities, and he did that because he knew at some point in the future, God is going to try to bring Israel in, and when God tries to bring Israel in, Satan's like, we're going to fight. Now, God's going to win. There's no question about that. The point I'm trying to get to is, did Satan actively oppose what God was trying to do? And the answer is he did. Now, Satan understands that this squabble over the earth continues. In Isaiah 14, when Satan rebels, when Lucifer rebels, he makes five I will statements. And one of those is, I will be like the Most High. The Most High, according to Genesis 14, 19, is the Most High God who is the possessor of heaven and earth. So when Satan rebels and says, I will be like the Most High, what he's saying is, God, you created everything. You created heaven and earth, but I'm going to subvert it so that it's not going to really be yours. It's going to be mine. Now, he does that on earth by trying to take control of the earth's structures and by keeping Israel in a condition of idolatry so that God cannot use them. Do you remember when Israel is going to the promised land and God says to them, basically, you need to destroy the wicked nations that are there and you need to not learn their ways. And they, they need to not learn their ways because what happens is if Israel goes into idolatry, then they cannot be the chosen nation vessel that God wants them to be. And so there's that conflict between God and Satan. Well, think with me then about the heaven just for a minute. As you think about the heaven, do angels have the ability to create new angels? They don't. God created all the angels he was going to create in Genesis 1. At the end of Genesis 1, he rested. So if angels can't create new angels, that means the number of angels is a fixed number. It doesn't increase. It's not true with humanity, right? The population of humanity is always increasing. The population of the angels is not. There's a fixed number that God created. When Satan led his rebellion in the heavenly places, what did he do? What he did is he went around to the different angelic authorities and convinced them to follow them in his rebellion. Now, I will take time to fully prove this, but if you read Daniel 10, Daniel 10 ha has a messenger angel, Gabriel, that says, there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. Meaning that Satan's rebellion seems to have infected the higher levels of the heavenly government. In other words, 
as you think about government on earth, is there federal government and then state government and county government and local government? In other words, are there hierarchies of governmental authority on the earth? There are. Are there hierarchies of governmental authority in the heaven? Yes, there are. Similar, similar structure. Well, Satan was able to corrupt those higher levels. Most of them rebelled. So back to Acts 8, as Satan surveys the universe and he's fighting with God over the earth, he looks at the heaven and says, well, God, what are you going to do? You only created so many angels. The ones that have fallen, they can't get back on your side because did Christ die to redeem angels? No, he didn't take upon himself the nature of an angel. Hebrews 2 is clear about that. He took upon himself the nature of a man. So angels can't be redeemed. When an angel falls, they cannot get back on the right side. So in Acts 8, here's my point, just piece this all together. There's a fixed number of angels. The leading angels in heaven have rebelled against God the Father, and they can't be redeemed. So in Acts 8, Satan looks at it and says, well, yeah, we'll fight over control of the earth, but hey, the, the authorities in heaven are mine. You created them, but I turned them. They're following me. And you can't redeem them because Christ didn't die for them. So Satan had a certain smug confidence about that. And by the way, can you read about the body of Christ anywhere in the Old Testament or Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or early Acts? You can't. What 1 Corinthians 2 is getting to, and this is mind-boggling, what God is doing today, when you believe the gospel, you are spiritually placed into the body of Christ. The body of Christ has a heavenly inheritance. Ephesians 1.3 1, says we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So where are you going to spend eternity? Heaven. At the rapture, you will be caught sideways. No, you will be caught up. Why are you caught up? Because you're going upward, you're going to heaven. So what's going on simply is this. What God did with the dispensation of grace is he kept it a mystery. It was hid from ages and generations. It was hid in God. 1 Corinthians 2 tells you it was not known under the principalities and powers, the princes of this world. The princes of this world are not Charles and Camilla. The princes of this world are the Ephesians 6 spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, the devil had no understanding of the dispensation of grace and no understanding of the body of Christ. When, when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, he dies for the sins of Israel. That's true. Who else did he die for? The entire world. And what happens during the dispensation of grace, when someone believes the gospel, they're placed into the body of Christ. They have this heavenly inheritance. And what God is doing with the body of Christ is he is forming the new replacement government that is going to take the positions currently occupied by Satan and his minions. And that's why Satan and his principalities and powers, the princes of this world, would not have crucified the Lord of glory if they understood that. It was playing right into God's hands. God's going to use the cross to purchase the body of Christ. It's going to remove Satan. Now, that fact is why more people don't believe the mystery. So 2 Corinthians 4 says Satan is the God of this world. Colossians 2 says that by the cross, what, what the Lord did is he spoiled principalities and powers. The cross defeated them. What does it mean when people talk of the spoils of war? What is the spoils of war? It's materiel. In other words, when an army conquers another army, you know one of the things they do? They take control of all the stuff. 
because they want the food and the supplies and the ammunition and the armor. They want all of that, right? Because they're going to use that for their further purposes. Well, when Colossians 2 refers to the Lord of, as having spoiled principalities and powers, the idea is that they were defeated and the stuff that was theirs was taken from them. So how does Satan feel about the mystery? He hates it because it's, the, it's his defeat. And not only is it his defeat, it's his embarrassment. Because what did Satan do? Here's the reality. Satan, when you entered into Judas and you brought about the Lord's crucifixion and you thought you were so clever, in other words, you're going to put the Son of God to death and you're going to mock him, right? Because think of everything that happens on, think of everything that happens leading up to and on the cross. It's not simply the Lord's death, it's his humiliation, right? They offer him vinegar. They give him a crown of thorns. They bow down. They mock him. If thou be the Christ, save thyself. Well, was he the Christ? Yes. But the Christ wouldn't save himself or we'd all be damned. So that was just an obnoxious, insulting, ridiculous thing to say is what that was. So what Satan is doing with the cross and all those things is I'm going to have the Son of God put to death, and I'm going to mock him and humiliate him in all these ways. And he thought, you know, I'm tough, and I'm going to show my power, and I'm going to do this. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in his immense grace, in his immense love, endures all of it to redeem humanity. God keeps a secret and then reveals guess what else that accomplished? And Satan suddenly realizes, oh, all my boasts about my wisdom, how clever I am, I'm going to take creation and subvert it to my purposes. I was outwitted. So how does he feel about that mystery being made known? He hates it because it's his humiliation. Let me, let me put it this way. The prophecy program is about power. In Genesis 3, when the fall occurs, God specifically lays out exactly what he's going to do. He tells Satan he's going to be destroyed by the seed of the woman. If you've ever wondered why there were giants in Genesis 6, why the angels try to corrupt the human seed line, it's because they understand Genesis 3, the Redeemer is going to come from the seed of the woman. And if we can corrupt it, we can prevent that from happening. The satanic efforts are to oppose, notice this, what God told him exactly he was going to do. In other words, I'm going to destroy you with the seed of the woman. Later on, he says, it's going to be from the tribe of Judah. Later on, he says, it's from the line of David. Every time God does that, because God doesn't lie, he's aiming a target on someone, right? He's telling Satan, this is who you need to destroy. And the reason why I say the prophecy program is about God's power is what God is doing is he's telling Satan, he's saying, look, I'm going to destroy you. And I'm telling you right now how I'm going to do it. So do what you will. Try your best. Bring friends. You can't prevent what I am going to do. And God, of course, accomplished that because God is omnipotent and Satan is not. God can tell him, this is exactly what I'm going to do, and you can do nothing about it. Amen. Here's the thing. Since the prophecy program is a demonstration of God's power, as, as we both know, are there a lot of things in life where the more powerful wins, but it's not necessarily the side of right? Life on earth tells you that happens, right? But Satan's rebellion was not that God was... Satan's rebellion was not that he was more powerful than God. He wasn't saying that. But what he was saying was, I'll outwit you. You've made this creation, but I'm going to subvert it for my purposes. And he thought that he had successfully done that. 
because the powers in heaven were his. They had followed him in his rebellion. And God's response to that was just to keep teensy little secret about the dispensation of grace. And Satan undoes his own plan. And God accomplishes exactly what he's going to do in the heavens. So we'll, we'll close with this. We started with, there are two things you need to get. You obviously need to get the gospel to be saved, right? You understand Christ died for sins and buried and rose again. You're saved by grace through faith, not your works. You need to have that. But here's the, here's the issue if you're saved. You ready? Most of Christendom, the vast majority of Christendom, the Bible is a confused, closed book. Because the fundamental revelation for the time in which we live is the Pauline revelation of the mystery of the dispensation of grace that we're supposed to operate according to. And I, I'm guessing this is the case. When I was first saved, I said, well, I need to start reading the New Testament. The Old Testament was too long. So I better start with the New Testament. And you read through the New Testament and you realize, man, there's things here that are saying they're, they're different and they're good. They can't be wrong for obvious reasons. It's not wrong, but there, there's something going on here that I don't understand. And what happens is most of churchianity learns ways to massage the verses and go to the original Greek, and this commentator says this, and they learn a whole bunch of techniques to make the Word of God not say what it says so it produces harmony in their mind. And meanwhile, that makes the Bible of none effect is what it does. But when you get clarity about the Pauline revelation, you can then let every verse say exactly what it says, because you understand there are things written to different audiences, and you can then identify that which is written to us that we need to understand and operate according to today. Amen? Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we rejoice in your goodness. We, we thank you for the scriptures, their perfection, their preservation, we pray that you would give us understanding. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.